Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams D Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and we are coming at you with another episode in our third retrospective series. We are talking about the National. Last time we were on here, we talked about the National's debut, the self-titled album, and now we're here talking about sophomore effort, sad songs for dirty lovers. So, Riley, what has happened in the timeline of the National since the self-titled <laughs> has been released well there's still an up-and-coming promising sort of alt country by way of slight tenders of americana sort of ulti rocky band uh though one thing that is happening is that the timelines are moving more and more towards the nationals reinvention as uh truly smooth slicked up indie rockers we're hitting towards that point but we're not quite there yet and we won't really get fully there for another couple of albums but with sad songs for dirty lovers the national take a little bit of a step away from some of the sparse introspection of their self-titled debut which we talked about two weeks ago a somewhat charming if slightly lacking in substance record that definitely had some promise within it but also leaves a lot to be desired i think it's fair to say that the gate they really take a big leap forward with this record um the songs in general are more ambitious the arrangements are more filled out this actually makes marks the first record where band longtime guitarist bryce desner would be a full member of the band as opposed to just contributing alongside his brother aaron uh plus this in combination with the fact that this is the per the first national record to be at least partly produced by peter Cadis, who was is the legendary indie rock producer who would go on to produce their next two albums and would come to play a pivotal role in the sound of 2000s indie rock. So you have a shift happening here. You have the band developing and Matt in particular uh, reaching outward more with his lyricism, a bit more ambition in the guitar work and the compositions in tandem with a band that are really finding their sound more so than they had the first time round. This album came out in 2003, barely two years after the first record. And yeah, I would say that the distinction, the leap here is marked. And I have a lot of feelings about this record, Very, the vast majority of them positive. But I am curious to hear uh, what your guys' take on this record is. Jake, I believe this was actually the first national record you heard yeah uh funnily enough it was it was the thing that it was a bit delayed but it kind of spurred me on i had heard select songs from i think high violet because morgan made a playlist for me back when we met that had songs uh like vander lyle cry baby geeks on them and i was like boy i really just i should listen to this band uh and this was the first one i had heard uh just because it was seemingly like the 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 first one truly like worth hearing really the uh the the bends of the national if you will uh and i didn't uh really revisit it uh formerly until funnily enough you recommended it to me again after we had met uh and we were talking about um breakup albums and i i was just like i need recommendations for some so i had a i I think Peter Cadis produced the Midnight Organ Fight. He didn't did, he? yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a double feature, uh, a double listen of this album and that album for the uh, first time uh, back at the beginning of 2019, 2020. I don't even remember. But still, I have uh, a lot of fond memories of this particular album. And by fond memories, I mean memories where I felt like garbage. I was going to say, uh, you, you, you doubled <laughs> both of those albums and you didn't throw yourself into a wood chipper. I, yeah. I, I, and the thing was, I was in close proximity to a, a garbage shoot because it was at work where I listened to this. So I could have just tossed myself in there. And I, I, I make it a point of personal pride that I didn't. Yeah, um, remarkable restraint just, showed there. I consider that a point of pride on myself, both because uh, those albums are sad and because I think this album begins with probably a cold take the best song the national has made up until this point with the rather epic feeling six minute long cardinal song 
um <laughs> if you're an indie rock band that starts your album off with a uh, reference to cardinals shout out to the wonder years um you're you're, you're just going <laughs> for the throat immediately i see uh thank you for that guys um, yeah i choose to good, believe good, that the gosh wonder golly years, damn both the wonder years and pine grove are deliberately referencing this song particularly pine grove considering they're an old country band probably uh referencing this song with their the title of their classic 2016 album um but yeah the thing about this record is and it continues a the theme we were talking about in the last episode of the national perspective with their self-titled we are in this particular early era I would say that Matt Berninger as a lyricist is uh, considerably less guarded, considerably less, uh, I would say, focused. And um, there is an unhinged quality to the way that Matt writes and performs on the early era records of The National. I don't think anywhere is that truer than on this album. Uh, This is um, when we get to the next record, we'll talk about how that record marks the beginning of a creative partnership between Matt and his longtime partner and co-writer Corinne. But this is kind of the last echelons, the last kind of echoes of Matt as a singular creative force, kind of unfixed, unchecked, and expressing some really troubling sentiments. I mean, this is a particularly grim record, uh, listening experience. There are moments of levity and there are moments where it does lead up, but they are few and far between. Between, I mean, the first seven songs on this record are just a consistent run of some of the most dour and kind of heartbreakingly depressing i wouldn't even call it sad necessarily it's not really sad it's kind of again there's a bitterness that comes through that was definitely uh, a quality of the self-titled album that i think is even more refined here into some sentiments that truly feel caustic and are matched with arrangements that suitably get that feeling of anxiety and just kind of like stress and panic that kind of underlies all of these manic feelings um and there are a number of songs on this record that will kind of end in a completely different place to where they began there are like cardinal song and it never happened for instance are songs that after a certain point you're you're used to this kind of dreamy and pretty meditative pace that kind of gets disrupted by this downward spiral into paranoia that's communicated just just through the music essentially and that's leaves the whole thing like it's a messy record in the same way that i think their next record is they still are a band that are embracing a kind of throw everything at the wall mentality and a kind of deliberate raggedness to their sound that i think kind of goes hand in hand with the kind of like wine drenched drunk ragged image that matt berninger kind of projects in these early era national records but really it comes through here you it's so funny to describe cardinal's song as an epic intro because like in terms of length and in terms of like the scope of the track musically i would agree but also it's i listened to it like four o'clock this morning and it was just this meditative dreamy kind of like just this thing that i just melt into and it feels comforting to a certain extent until it doesn't or really until you just pay any attention until to you read the lyrics lyrics that, and then you're just like about. It, it arrives at this point at the end where you're just kind of like oh all right go jump off a bridge see you guys it's disconcerting and it's kind of it lets you sort of linger in this stasis empty space of just kind of like hopelessness in a way that they kind of wouldn't even do again until like trouble will find me i would say it's very much a rare state for the national to exist and uh yet that's also matched with some of their most aggressive and groove based and really kind of gnarly songs as well tracks like a slipping husband tracks like murder me rachel tracks like available as well these are some of the noisiest some of the most infernally gritty songs that the national have released to date and would ever release really i mean they just hit with a they hit with the impact of a fucking four by four just completely smashing into you it's 
it's quite startling, I think, especially when you're lulled into this state of sort of suspended ambience by that first track and by the entire album that preceded this. Like, what do you guys think of the the more sort of aggressive and louder moments on this record and how do they kind of register as a step forward for this band? I mean, it's like if one of the first four or five Tom Waits records, he just stood up from behind the piano and got in your face and just screamed in you, at it, in your face. The, the definitive version of something like Murder Me, Rachel, for me, is actually the live cut on Cherry Tree EP. Mm. And Beringer's vocal delivery the on the studio version, but especially that version, it's it's like it's a little uncomfortable, honestly. Mm-hmm. Just like it's not, it doesn't sound good. I don't know. It, it's almost like a performance in a Cassavetes film or something. Mm. Well, it's kind of like his like whole tormented, humiliated, masculine id is just sort of tumbling out of him. Like it's so bitter and caustic. I mean, lyrics like. Uh, her pretty little ribbons, her pretty little name, sew it in my skin, she'll never go away. Like, I mean, for starters, could has there ever been a more simplistic but also more like evocatively horrifying way of describing getting a tattoo than sewing someone's name into your skin like you're just stabbing yourself with a needle? Like the whole song has this just quite untethered feel to it. Like you don't, like, like, some kind of horrific act of violence is like imp- immediately going to happen at some point. It, this person is just going to snap. And it, it, it's true, like psychotic, to be honest, to listen to. And it's given context by other songs, I think, like Sliving Husband and Available as well, where it's like not only this sense of an explosive psychosis triggered by, you know, years and years of pent up masculine repression combined with you know dangerous levels of alcohol it's this sense of isolation that that state induces in you in the sense that you don't trust anyone especially if people are coming at you from the perspective of uh judging you or attempting to shape you in the image that they want i mean slipping husband is a really and, and available both I, those t- two songs kind of go together to me because they're kind of about the same thing which is this idea of it, like existing within this particular role within this conventional very white bread middle class vision of masculinity and of like the nuclear family where the suspension within that role starts to feel so suffocating and you put the blame directly on the people around you and it's not that that blame is misplaced necessarily but you only get this one very insular perspective where this person essentially is convinced that they are being driven to their death essentially uh metaphorically by the constraints of the role they have to play but almost in the songs literally by this partner or this force that manifests within this relationship that is essentially pushing this person to drink to embarrass themselves to act in a way that is for the entertainment and amusement of others and for the humiliation of them so it's like a really uncomfortable insight into this very paranoid and isolating state of mind that when you are so used to the more i guess sort of humorous and tongue-in-cheek sort of self-mocking versions of this kind of masculinity that matt would go on to write from the perspective of in the later records it really feels jarring to listen to it here yeah i mean the most albums on the song in some way or another feel like watching some like a really drunk stand-up comedian just completely bomb on stage but like the the instrumentals are really tight (laughs) jake what do you think what do you think about like the the emotions on this album and like the feeling and what's coming through in some of that harsh lyrical content I think like most retrospective uh, like listens, like when I evaluate it from the the context of the band, I end up always appreciating albums that I 
may have like taken a little bit for granted beforehand not that my like opinion on this album has like changed or anything but the 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 the, the contrast of of difference from the debut to here really is like kind of astonishing and how like I said in that episode that it was just like you have to really walk a fine line of like trying to project this idea of sort of, uh, you know, this kind of like this monotone kind of bumbling uh, semi improvisational delivery that Berninger has and, and do it while feeling like it's skillfully employed and not just kind of like sleepy or lazy. And here it's just like like 90 percent of the time on this album it's just flawless and not to mention you also have moments that are completely uncharacteristic of the previous record like you have like the end of slipping husband where it just fucking chills at the end of this song when it just fucking explodes and you're just like whoa did not think that the band who made the self-titled album was capable of doing this yeah and it's not the only time that happens on this album no. I mean, like it's it it literally does actually scare the shit out of you, like in a in a way that feels like I I expect it to come even because I've heard this album before, and yet it still manages to still surprise me every single time, and I think that is reflected in both the instrumentals and the lyricism in that I feel like that sort of the idea of like poking a hole in these suburban norms is kind of like that idea is semi explored on the album before this but it's really elaborated upon here i really get that impression on stuff like cardinal song feels like a song that sort of like explores this dynamic uh between you know a, a suburban husband and wife and at the very end it feels like here you're snapping out of this psychosis and it feels like you felt the main character of the song like age 10 years forward it's really fucking jarring at the very end and then you have slipping husband which feels like it's more from the perspective of the wife's point of view than it is the husband's point of view and you sort of get this kind of like back and forth of them kind of exploring each other's really like natural faults you have like the uh the lyrics the uh you could have been a legend but you became a father and that's why what you are today which is like some of the most like it, it doesn't inherently sound like it has an acidic quality to it but when you hear it performed it's just like oh wow it sounds like the from the way he says it it sounds like matt berninger says a father is like it sounds like it's the worst possible thing you could be and it's also on stuff like uh murder me rachel i think again uh morgan mentioned the live rendition of that that's on the cherry tree ep which i have to say i love both versions of the song do slightly for that version but here also just a very good song and honestly this lays the groundwork for a lot of what i think they would build off of in the future specifically off of uh the on the album boxer uh, uh boxer and uh sleep well beast very specifically i think that um sleep well beast is almost a reprisal of the idea of this but like specifically employed into a very like into a tighter narrative into a more uh far-reaching sound it's a little bit more ambitious and a little bit more cohesive there but you can see where they're laying the groundwork here and where they're trying to embody all of these ideas that feel like they're they're getting at the this sort of portrait of an american specifically kind of family and I, I really think that here that's sort of amplified by it, that, that sort of depressing quality that Riley mentioned earlier, that it's not necessarily sad and it, it's not exactly like super emotionally dynamic, like I think a lot of those later records are, but it still manages to come through by feeling really powerful and really strong it doesn't ever really feel like one note like the debut could there are moments where like i think it's kind of uh undeniable that like if this album were like the first seven songs and then the closer it would be like primo shit there's a there's a couple places where i think the band do stumble in the second half just a teeny little bit um, and they do kind of slip back into those tendencies of the the self-titled um, a little itty bitty bit, albeit still better here, probably. It, it just feels like the band 
fully know what they're doing both instrumentally and thematically so they're in unison the whole time they really feel like they know how to flesh out an entire album experience so like while this may land on the sort of lesser half of the discography overall it still feels in it still feels kind of like inviting and holistic and you really feel absorbed in it and mm -hmm. like despite the fact that they would elaborate on it later you never feel like oh this is good but like i, I feel like i'm getting a, a sort of half portion here and i want them to to do more if it, it feels substantial while you're listening to it which is perhaps the biggest compliment i can afford it i feel as though the album has this curious structure where it kind of builds tension for the first the, i mean the first seven songs are a really fascinating progression of music because you kind of get tension built through this interlocking of these more i don't even want to say traditional because that's not right in terms of the alt country here like cardinal song is not traditional in any sense it's basically a formless song there's no real structure to it six minutes at all um but there are these kind of really atmospheric and even ambient uh country inflected indie rock songs like that one like it never happened and the eternally underrated thirsty uh that are kind of intertwined between these more caustic moments like slipping husband and murder me rachel and available which i want to zero in on uh as my kind of as the kind of my final point in terms of talking about the louder songs in this record because to me this is like the most uncomfortable national song that exists like this is the most <laughs> aggressive the most caustic the most like there have been points i've had a long relationship with this album like with every national album and there are points where i just think this song there are some days where i think this song is just too much it's too goes too far it heads too far into the red for a performer like matt and i just can't get on board with it and then there are other days when I listen to it, I'm like, this is the fucking most amazing song I've ever fucking heard. Like, <laughs> I, I, I alternate between these different states. Like, it's just deeply discomforting to hear Matt sing lines like, did you clean yourself for me last night? Uh, yeah. And <laughs> did you dress me down and liquor me up to make me last for the minute when the red comes over you? Like it does when you're filled with love or whatever you call it. Like it's really just oh, skin crawling. Do you feel alone when I'm in my head while you wait for me to take my breath? Now that uh, that's a great lyric because that's a call, almost uh, like a callback or like a response or even like a progression of the lyric I talked about on Bitters and Absolute in the last album about like being the partner of someone like this who has to, who lays there in bed imagining the perfect life that their partner is imagining and whether or not they would be a part of it. And this is kind of like the other side of that dynamic where it is the drunken, you know, potentially abusive belligerent or maybe just depressed person who is laying there wondering about their partner and how their self-imposed isolation is making them feel. Uh, but it is like, a, it's, a, it's still a song that has so much combative hatred in it and it's hard to even tell whether it's outwardly addressed or inwardly addressed or both i mean the finale of the song where the band essentially just go so far into the red that it just completely melts down and you've heard matt scream multiple times on this record up to this point but somehow he manages to access another dimension of anguish in the way that he screams why did you dress me down and liquor me up at the end of the song that truly feel like it's i'm not surprised and in, in some ways i'm it's easier for me to be forgiving of the fact that the album kind of just hits the brakes after this because it's such a bold and kind of just conversation stopping song like it just halts everything because it's that kind of climactic and intense <laughs> That the record kind of has no breaks, way of... But Sugar Wife is right after this, so it kind of hits the curb a tiny little bit before it gets well, back onto the road. It's kind of like, it tries to sort of like, um, try and step back from the seriousness for a second. And it, it does have a couple of songs after this that are a little bit more irreverent. Sugar Wife being yeah. the most egregious offender, I'm going to say handily, I think the worst national song, at least the worst one on an album, uh, but it's yeah. very, it's very short and and kind of easy to just skip over. 
Uh, Trophy Wife is only a little bit better, but I will say I do kind of yeah. like I like the tone of the song a little bit. It's kind of grown on me. The refrain of it is is not bad. Uh, I do. It's think... a good song. It's just only a good song. Yeah, I think that Fashion Coat is a kind of like a nice little uh, underrated jam song. It actually reminds me so much of early spoon like their album girls can tell which they put out in 2001 yeah. has a lot of songs that sound like this uh i quite enjoy it uh patterns of fairy tales i would go as far as to say is kind of an underrated little song it experiments with synthesizers but it does it in a way that it definitely sounds very early 2000s but also there's a kind of prettiness to it that feels of a piece with earlier songs on the record plus I really like lyrics like uh, tonight there isn't any light under your door. I guess you must be somewhere breathing, which is again, it's just very evocative and a very sort of like kind of slightly creepy way that Matt is really great at doing in this early era. But all this is to say, I will kind of sum up my thoughts by talking about my favorite song on this record, which I haven't mentioned at all yet, uh, which is the third song on this album, 90 Mile Water Wall. Which, I mean, it's not only my favorite song on this record, I think it is, it's probably in my top 10 national songs. This Ooh. song is... Yeah, it's great. It's pain. It, it, I mean, like, I've talked about awkwardness, I've talked about anxiety, I've talked about anguish, pain, all of these different emotions that come through on this record. This one is, like, nihilistic. <laughs> like, this song is, like... Yeah. You just accept, essentially, that you, you, your only fate is suffering and that opening set of lyrics is fucking dark yeah it's like this belief that you are viewed like through this lens of of essentially just pure uh, a loathing like pure hatred essentially that that no one that everyone around you who sees you like sees you as essentially this embarrassment this drunkard this no no this person to you know essentially where you would happily have a trap door fall from under your feet to stop having to be in their presence essentially it's such a a brutally self-loathing song and it's really augmented by this amazing amazing violin contribution from Pad Newsom, who is uh, a really frequent collaborator of the Nationals in this early period. Uh, Padma would show up and contribute a lot of the sort of string instrumentation to records like Alligator and Boxer as well. But this is a really strong early feature from them. An amazing, amazing violin uh, contribution here just completely tears my soul into pieces when they have their little solo in this song it's god it's it's uh, i have to be having a really bad time to feel up to listening to this to be honest and when i am when i'm in that state of just pure exhaustion or just pure just depressive loathing then nothing hits quite like it i mean it's it's a rough rough track i mean the first three songs here i think is a as a as a consecutive run of songs i think is the most depressing this and, and just purely kind of hopeless this band would get where the typical shades of kind of like self-aware wry kind of like levity that you will get from alligator onwards are just they're not coming to the fore here yet um yeah i mean morgan what are some of the standouts to you like what is what are the, some of the songs that you come back to when, and the feelings that you come back to when you listen to this record? My absolute favorite on here is the closing track, Lucky You, which I, th- I think is really the only moment on the album that gives you a moment to sort of meaningfully process it, I guess, yeah. in, a, in a way that doesn't feel as self-destructive as its narrator feels we were talking about it in our group chat earlier riley said it would be like a perfect uh closing to a film and to end credit song uh to like yeah. an alexander payne dramatic comedy and uh yeah uh, and now i can o- now i can only think of sideways when i think about this song <laughs> so yeah. there's that i guess yeah, um, it has that kind of like early 2000s feel. I also compared it to like Amy Mann and like Save Me and the kind of like John Bryan adjacent yeah. kind of folk rock that was happening in the late 90s 
Uh, it just has that real feel to it, especially when you've gone through the weeds with this album and you just get that crisp acoustic guitar that comes in at the start of this and it feels like you're waking up from a nightmare, essentially. Yeah, it, it both lyrically and instrumentally and in terms of just the sound of it, it feels like the first sort of moment of clarity on the album. And it's, I think it's only appropriate that it it's the one that closes the album considering the subject matter really is like sobering up you have like select moments on here where i think that there's a lot of artificial instrumentation on this album that there's also like a lot of drum machines and what have you so there are these moments where organic instrumentation shows up and it's really like i mean it's very sobering feeling you're just kind of like snapped out of it and it feels like that lucky you is the first moment where it feels like completely unencumbered like it happens on 90 mile water wall but like still some of that song still sounds a little bit like cluttered and messy and a lot of the other songs do on do too on here that feels like the only moment where you're just kind of like oh wow you just kind of have all of the obstructions are kind of cleared for the first time yeah and like it's you know it's a great demonstration of the versatility of the band in this stage i have to believe that bringing bryce on full time had a big impact because uh he was actually in a band a modern classical sort of chamber band called clogs uh before he joined the national and that's a, a band that violinist uh padman newsom was in as well as the bassoonist Rachel Elliott, who would go on to contribute a lot of the kind of like deep brassy horn parts to Alligator and Boxer and High Violet as well, I think. And I have a pet theory. I have no reason to think this other than the name that she is the uh, the Rachel that Murder Me Rachel is named after. Uh, but anyway, my point with this point being maybe some deep dive big national heads might have opinions on that. The influence of that kind of more chamber style of music the the presence of more ambitious string arrangements here which bryce is no doubt contributing to in a big part i think shows how the band have really made a quantum leap not only in figuring out their sound but also in distinguishing an identity that separates them from a lot of the bands that we were comparing them to or the the reference points that came up when we talked about their first record and the i mean this is a quantum leap above the self-titled and the next record is a quantum leap above this so it's really you get a sense that you're finding you're observing a band instantly becoming one of the great american bands of their generation in real time and it's almost as though the great ideas are coming to fruition and are forming themselves together so quickly that the band can barely kind of keep up and like uh put them together into a like cohesive album until like their third record but this is very close to that um yeah and i just think that the thing that's really sold me on this album in the long term is how well the majority of the deep cuts hold up to me like and how well when i come back to this record i'm like you know this song is better than I remember it being or this song stands out more the more I get to know it songs like thirsty songs like it never happened which has this like amazing okay computer-esque outro where it just kind of like becomes this miasma of of sounds uh patterns and fairy tales which I've already mentioned as well like the record it's a record that's so full I think of like deeply rooted treats and mysteries and secrets and little details to unravel also a record that is definitely improved uh by its fantastic uh remaster that was put out last year as well uh although it has a pretty terrible album cover i would still recommend uh if you're so inclined considering a vinyl purchase as well this is a record that sounds great on that medium and a record that i think deserves to be heard more, to be acknowledged more, not only by fans of the band, but by fans of indie rock in general. Uh, Yeah, it's a record that falters in moments, but I feel as though those few moments combined with, yeah, I really can't emphasize enough how awful the album cover is. Those two elements put together have maybe, I maybe have influenced this repu- the reputation of this record or people's willingness to engage with it somewhat. I don't know, pet theory of mine. 
it has one of their best album titles as well like how could you not like at least want to listen to an album that's just as blunt and straightforward about its melodramatic sensibilities as sad songs for dirty lovers it has that real sort of like uh seedy feel of a lot of alternative indie adjacent i guess americana-esque uh vaguely electronic records of the time it just fits in so well and yeah and i'm glad it got we got the chance to talk about it in full for an episode because yeah it's sensational i will i will say in defense of the album cover i do think it is at least better than the cover of the self-titled i mean no i kind of like the, the idea there's the, the the picture of the goofy dude in the pool like to me that captures the essence of the kind of like white bred middle class sort of like yeah, pathetic masculinity is the, the remastered kind of cover about. different than the normal cover it's the color that the color palette is slightly less grotesque but it's very oh, much the same i i like the album cover actually i oh okay. yeah I, I think it perfectly represents the the sound that it's going for it's that hazy image of the the woman's face and that's sort of like the the colorful inside always sort of conveyed to me that feeling of the the internal monologue of uh you know people that are just project this this hazy kind of untoward uh sort of unappealing looking kind of uh shell no i can i can respect that i'm actually kind of glad that i mean there's some i mean it's it's literally in terms of comparing it to the self-titled album is like this one evokes something in me yeah and yeah, this one exactly. is a picture of a, a man in a pool uh yeah so her father you know, is the pool her father's first he came his heart beat he heard happy sylvia anyway um happy sylvia it's all coming together uh yeah no, well, carol carol anyway. corinne <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> anyway that's a, actually a nice little meaninglessly divisive point to end out on, I think. Uh, continue that debate about the album covers in the comments below. Uh, James and T yeah, are our, just disagreeing our, our, over nothing. <laughs> are, are Morgan and I correct, or is Riley a moron? I'm actually curious um, to hear from our viewers at home if anyone would rank this over any other albums besides the self-titled. Unless... The yeah. album in question, yeah. you rank it over as I Am Easy to Find, in which case, cool, you're like everyone else, I don't care. Uh, hey, you're wrong. Delusional. I used good. to prefer this over Alligator. That was a long time ago. Mm. Hey, you live and learn. Yeah. Favorite tracks and ratings then for the National Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers. Jake, why don't you lead us off? Uh, yeah, the aforementioned insanely depressing run of the first three tracks here is my favorite three tracks. Uh, my favorite song the National have made so far is Cardinal Song, and then Slipping Husband and 90 Mile Water Wall are my other two favorites on here. So, yeah, least favorite song on here, yeah, handily, Sugar Wife. It's it's probably the National's worst song, but not even like because it's like actively bad, it, it is, but it's just kind of like. Why'd I'm a butterfly. I'm a butterfly. Why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? I don't know man? about this one, um, Chief. I just have to like, <laughs> can you make me a man? Can you make me a dad? <laughs> like, well, that's such a fucking weird line. It's, it, like, and it, it, it's it's made worse when you, if like if you take this out. First of all, I don't. I think this is the only actively bad song on the album. And you go into Trophy Wife. Which is like the exact same song sentiment wise. Like it does exactly the same thing structurally for the album. So it's just like empirically improved if you remove it. So like whatever. But uh yeah, this gets a seven from me. All right, Morgan. Uh yeah, uh three favorites, Lucky You, Cardinal Song, and Murder Me Rachel. Uh least favorite is the 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 sugar mama uh seven and a half out of ten just to keep it spicy nice um my three favorite tracks are 90 mile water wall cardinal song and i will say murder me rachel least favorite is sugar wife although you know i i, I didn't really emphasize this enough 
I actually quite like Trophy Wife. It's grown on me. It's still probably like I would rank it second from the bottom if I had to rank the songs in this album. But that song has grown on me a little bit, um, which, you know, any song managing to grow on me on any national album after I've heard them all genuinely no less than 20 and probably in some cases upwards of 100 times is something. Yeah, these records are full of surprises still to me. Um, yeah, and my least favorite song is Sugar Wife, which I think I already said, so that's pointless, and I'll cut that out. And I'm going to give the album a 7.5 out of 10, which means we get an average overall of 7.3 for the Nationals' Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers. Let us know at home what you think of the Nationals' second album. Uh, where does it fit for you in your national ranking? Do you think it's underrated like us? Do you not quite care for it as much? Do you think they still haven't quite found their sound here? What are some of the standouts to you? What are some of the lowlights to you? Where did you come across this album in your journey of listening to The National? We want to hear from you in the comments below. Uh, one of the great joys of our last retrospective, the Burke retrospective, was getting to hear comments from people who've been Burke, Burke fans for a long time following us through this journey. So we hope that there is at least one or two out of, of you out there who are going to do the same. And if you are, please let us know. We want to hear from you in the comments. There's no greater joy than hearing from you in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like and of course subscribe to the channel so you don't miss subsequent episodes of the National Retrospective hitting every other Friday on this channel. But until next time, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Miller High Life, the champagne of beers.